Welcome everyone to History Today. So this is a podcast style discussion of the way history makes its way into our daily lives. Uh, today we'll be discussing Vikings, the way they raided Britannia through the lens of the show Vikings, the TV show. It's going to be a sprawling discussion, kind of setting the stage for this general time period. Uh, and I am pleased to introduce James McMullen here, and I'll let him give a brief introduction. Uh, hi, uh, I'm James. Uh, I am a, a museologist from Canada. I've got a master's degree in medieval Icelandic, uh, medieval Icelandic studies from the University of Iceland, uh, and I'm currently waging an eternal war against Viking Age misinformation on Twitter. You can follow me there at uh, the Viking Gym. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, and like the, the whole purpose of this series, uh, and we talked about this before, is to take the way the general populace interacts with history and <laughs> bring experts in to try and correct it. Uh, the educational slant of all this. Um, so there is a lot to discuss uh, in just, you know, we took about 30 seconds of the show Vikings, and we're going to talk about it for 30 minutes. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot more to discuss in the future. Um, generally, before we dive into things, uh, could you recap maybe your impressions of the TV show Vikings? Um, I would like it a lot more if they called it generic medieval pirate adventure hour than Vikings, uh, yeah. because calling it Vikings gives me the sort of impression that there's going to be stuff that's vaguely historically accurate to the viking age and, and you know that doesn't really happen a whole lot <laughs> uh in the show but it's a good show it's it's entertaining for what it is yeah and it makes a uh, good fodder for discussions like this it really does <laughs> yeah so uh so we'll be diving into this one so the the general gist of this episode is talk about um, kind of the Vikings raiding, and in particular the way the show sets it up about they're going to be raiding the, the British Isles or Britannia. Mm -hmm. um, so the Vikings in the first episode, they proposed kind of three main points as to why they're going to be doing these raids now. Uh, the first point is they're searching for more profitable raiding targets. The second point is there's new navigation methods. And the third one is there's new shipbuilding methods. And these all come to a head in the first episode. And then from then on, this is what launches the campaigns of, I guess, Ragnar Lothbrok and the campaigns into Britannia. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're going to be diving into those three points. Um, the first one is going to be, hey, the search for more profitable trading routes. Uh, so we're going to be talking about kind of Vikings generally trading and raiding, but I did want to kind of read out a bit of what happens in the initial scene. Um, so I'll just go ahead and give you the context for that. So first you have Rolo who comes out and he's talking about kind of, you know, where do you think the Earl is going to send us this year? He talks about how the bastards to the east are as poor as we are. You know, what are we going to do? And then Ragnar comes in and he whispers mysteriously, oh, I think we should sail west. I've heard tales of great towns, hordes of gold and silver, and a new god. <laughs> and then Rolo's like, I've heard of these stories, but you know, you must be crazy. How can you cross this great ocean? Later on, they bring it up to the Earl, and he's like, oh, this is insane. Like, who's heard of this land to the west? So that's kind of the premise of the show here, that there's, uh, you know, they've never heard of the west before until there's secret tales that reveal it to them. So that's the context we're heading into here. Mm -hmm. um, so the first question that I had for you is, you know, were the Scandinavians really this uninformed absolutely not <laughs> um there's there's at the time that this is going on uh i mean when they're situating it with ragnar lothbrook uh being alive um you're 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 looking at a period of time where the scandinavian countries or what we would uh now refer to as scandinavia um have been getting christian missionaries from the franks uh, and, you know, in what is now Germany, for about 100 years, um, you're looking at uh, a period of time where they've been trading with Frankish settlements uh, along the western part of the, the Frankish Empire, so what is now modern France. Uh, you can't escape seeing England if you're going to France uh, by boat. Uh, and they've been trading in the east as well uh, for several hundred years. So they, they definitely absolutely were not uh, as uninformed of the existence of land to the West or of, you know, their mysterious Christian gods. Absolutely not accurate at all. Yeah, that's one of the things that kind of shocked me uh, in the show just <laughs> right from the get-go. It's kind of crazy. Uh, who, you know, who is this Earl that no one's heard of that, I mean, obviously no one's heard of him if he doesn't know anything about the, his surroundings. That was right. key because, like, in history you have during this time period 
trade is vastly important up here. They control a lot of raw resources. They really want to get those out and abroad, bring back finished goods and all that stuff. So knowing your surroundings is super important, especially after the age of migrations, which like causes disruption. Then you have to go ahead and kind of reforge these trade paths. And there's lots of opportunities for uh, enterprising, I guess, in that sense of, you know, reaching out and finding where you can get these new trade routes and controlling exactly. them. Exactly. Exactly. And I mean, also, um, at that point, from about 400 CE or so, so about 400 years before the start of the the TV show, um, the Danish uh, trade routes and Danish political influence extended out to uh, what is now Kent and the Isle of Wight in England, right? Um, there is uh, there's a Danish scholar named Olfert Voss who has been doing work on um, on collecting all the information about these Danish political and trade uh, missions in Eastern England and in the Isle of Wight. So yeah, again, if if this if this Jarl, if this Earl had no idea that there was land to the west, <laughs> he's less of an Earl and more like you know Bjorn about the fjord, who who reeks of salt fish and has never been outside of the valley, right? Like I mean, <laughs> yeah. There's that option, which could be the case, but I don't really think so. You don't get Gabriel Byrne to play that kind of guy. <laughs> yeah. And, and speaking, I guess, of locations, the show isn't necessarily so specific, but uh, they call, talk about uh, Kattegat, I think, which is supposed to be around Denmark. Kattegat is, yeah, is supposed to be in Denmark, but they place it in southern uh, Norway. And either way, they have giant mountains in the fjord, and it's just like, hmm. <sighs> This is not what any of this part of the country or any of these parts of the, those countries look like. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And I, well, it's filmed. The, the show's filmed in what, like County Wicklow, I think, in Ireland, right? Oh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. I think I think it is, and and that would make sense because that's an Irish sort of uh, <laughs> terrain, not necessarily a Danish or Norwegian one. <laughs> Okay, so then we've we've made the point that they were keenly aware of their surroundings, and I did want to note as well. Um, I think the the Goths originally came from kind of this general area, yeah. moved out west, and then presumably some of them would have made their way back to their homeland, brought back tales, stories, uh, there's trade of weapons, etc. So there are a lot of back and forth information making its way Ab around. Absolutely, and I mean that's where you get uh, Jordanus and his history of the Goths. He goes to Go he talks about Gotland, uh, which is the island. Uh, what's you know, Sweden, Gotland, Denmark. It's it's all in that area there. Uh, so they are very keenly aware of there there being a whole lot of other stuff out there. Okay, and now we're going to be inter uh, talking a bit about how they interacted with that stuff out there. Mm -hmm. So generally, he's talking about trading and raiding, and then maybe mentioning how both could go hand in hand. Uh, so what we had talked about previously is. Uh, maybe we'll set the scene, kind of rewind sure. the clock back uh, to kind of the early, I guess, Bronze Age in the area. And uh, apparently, like, people have been living here for a long time. They've been doing a lot of the similar trading, uh, fishing in the area. And over time, they just expand and go further and further as contacts are, are made. Uh, d kingdoms around them start to develop. There's more goods to trade. So they slowly get further and further out over the years. Um, I think we talked about previously the trading and raiding would have been happening maybe a bit more south and east at first, mm -hmm. which is what the show is alluding to. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that makes it, it makes sense because you, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, what's now Denmark, the, the Danish territories bordered right on the northern part of Francia. And, you know, the Frankish territories are very, very, very wealthy compared to the relatively resource poor Scandinavian territories. So there's going to be a lot of cross-border raiding, and there's a lot and a lot of coastline there. So it's really easy to just kind of sail east, especially if you're from one of the the dozens of little islands that are sandwiched between mainland Denmark and mainland Sweden. It's a lot easier to sail east and raid along the northern, the Baltic coastline, essentially. Um, and you can see, actually, uh, there's a... Uh, there was an emporia that was built around 700 or so uh, called Rerik, uh, which is in near Wismar in modern Germany. Um, and you, it's a Slavic Scandinavian trading center, right? So, and that was, was built around 700. And that's a place where you're getting people who are, for one, trading with other parts of the world 
bringing their stuff to sell. And for two, you know, also people who are raiding, who are who are showing up and stealing things and killing people who get in their way. They come to sell all the stuff that they they've picked up, uh, whether that's material goods like amber and furs or silver, or even slaves. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there's there's a fairly thriving economy in the eastern part of the Scandinavian view of the world, right? And that starts, uh, you know, at least from 700 until into the early 9th century when Gudfred uh, decides that he wants to get rid of it as a potential trading um, adversary for his new uh, emporia, his new trading center of Hedeby or Hathabu. Uh, in southern Denmark, northern what's now northern Germany. So there's a big, big uh, sort of trend of trade in the East going yeah. on at this time. Yeah, so maybe that's kind of what the show is <laughs> is hinting at, that, okay, maybe historically that was a little bit more of the emphasis early on. Mm-hmm. Um, so like we said, um, materially, uh, I don't want to say material. they did have a fair amount of raw goods, valuable things, furs, oh, yeah. things from the Arctic Circle, amber, etc., but not much in terms of finished goods, right? Um, yeah. which is what they start to want more and more, especially they have more access to it as kingdoms around them develop. Um, so the growth of commerce is what leads to these pirates. And I think maybe we can use this as a transition to talk about like the term Viking itself, to go a Viking. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe you can give yeah. a bit more context for that. Well, Viking is a really, really, really weird word. Uh, it's both a noun and a verb. Um, so somebody who is what we consider a Viking is, you know, in the, the sense of it as a noun, they're a Viking. They're somebody who is a pirate, who is a raider. Um, the etymology of it is kind of cloudy at this point. It, we think it means either somebody from the bay or like the man of the bay. So somebody who spends a lot of time in a bay um, on a boat, presumably, or it could mean someone who goes a Viking. And as far as we can tell, the verb Viking means to go raiding or go on a voyage of piracy. So it's that sort of recursive, you're a Viking because you go Viking. Um, and you go Viking because you're a Viking yeah. uh, sort of thing. But yeah, so that's that's what we're, you know, as far as the, the concept of the word Viking is, uh, the, the term Viking um it should apply primarily to these pirates and these raiders, um, whether they're doing it as individual criminal enterprises or what we would consider criminal enterprises now, um, or whether they're doing it as a sort of uh, military political thing where the the their Jarl or their king says, okay, we're going to go and raid here. Either way, you're looking at them as being Viking or Vikings at that point. Great. Yeah, so we've kind of built up the idea that there's been a long uh, history of kind of raiding and trading in the area. Then you have the emergence or slow emergence of a group that can kind of sustain itself or derive a lot of livelihood off of, you know, specific Viking uh, pursuits, I guess. Um, And then as the economy develops around them, there's more opportunities for that. Um, And then... I guess the switch from east to west is just them expanding, looking for more opportunities, and the fact that as they're going to these various places, they do take account of kind of how strong is this kingdom, what are more opportunities to raid, and so kind of one of the things that triggers the movement or the shift to the west is you have the Franks, the Carolingians, uh, having internal weaknesses. Same thing with uh, you know in the, in the British Isles as well. Um, that's kind of one of the things that allows them to to focus on the west. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and that's yeah, and that's absolutely the case. Is once you start, once they start noticing that there's a a sort of deterioration in political stability, that's when they start figuring, well, we can take advantage of this. Um, and the the sort of trade and and shift westward actually have we don't have a lot of written evidence, a lot of uh, indigenous or domestic written evidence for it, just because of the the way that Scandinavian and particularly Danish culture developed uh, in the early medieval period. But we do have some really neat archaeological evidence that suggests a, a sort of shift from an eastern focus, a primarily eastern focus, to a more westward focus, and that's uh, in the form of the Danaverka, uh, this great, huge earthwork rampart that goes along uh, southern Denmark, uh, northern Germany. Um, 
the the second stage of it like because it was built in in a bunch of of different stages the first one is just this big ramp and and rampart to keep you know basically act as a border but the second part um there's a canal that's been dug going from it's going to be linking the uh the baltic sea on the east coast to the train river which will flow out to the eider which will give you right access right into the north sea so they've developed this way of moving ships instead of having to go all the way north around denmark and they can sail essentially in a straight line from the north sea into the baltic and vice versa to facilitate to facilitate trade going east and west and also to move ships and to move potentially raiders or vikings or, or military forces westward as well uh for whatever purposes they need that they decided were, were essential you don't necessarily want to start a work that intensive that huge without yeah. having a really good reason for it sure so yeah and then the, so the last thing i guess before we move on to um kind of the navigational methods and then mm -hmm. uh shipbuilding methods the last point i wanted to make is okay if we acknowledge this eventual shift to the west or increasing shift to the west um, it wasn't something that happened all of, a all of a sudden. The show portrays it, the raid on Linus Farm, they're like, oh my god, there's these new people out of nowhere, <laughs> what the, what's going on, the apocalypse? But like, in reality, all the records we have of like, Viking encounters, uh, that ended up violent was the local people are like, oh, hey, look, you know, the Danes are back. Let's go greet them. Or it's it's probably merchants. Let's go see what they have to trade. And you were that's saying, exactly well, they have a, they, this time they have an axe to trade. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly it. it. It's a lot of these raids, a lot of these, these initial attacks are exactly what you said. You know, hey, look, the, the Norsemen have arrived. They've probably brought fur and, and amber so we can give them you know, silver and, and artwork and things like that. And, oh, no, they didn't bring fur. They brought their axes. Well, we're in trouble now. Um, that That's, you know, you, you have uh, in Anglo-Saxon records that exactly happening. Mm -hmm. Danish traders that turned out to be marauders. Um, so there, there's very clearly an expectation that these, these uh, Scandinavians were not there for fighting, that they weren't strangers. They were guys who showed up fairly regularly and who were there on relatively peaceful terms, right? To trade whatever they had for whatever they wanted. Right? Great. Okay. So, it's, so it's a very gradual shift, right? Like it's not just sudden they're, they're murdering monks and <laughs> out of nowhere, right? You know, they knew these, these areas. Cool. All right. So we've covered kind of point one. <laughs> so we've kind of built it up to the slow ramping up to the shift to the west. So now we have to acknowledge or at least talk about, okay, what are the navigational methods that allow them to travel, uh, I guess, just in general, but also traveling west in the open seas uh, and also the shipbuilding methods. So we can start first with navigational methods. In the show, the way they propose it is kind of they use um, two items. Uh, the first one is going to be essentially... Um, what do they call it, like a sunboard, essentially. So the way they describe it in the show is it's a, a wooden disc that you place on water so that if the boat's rocking or whatever, you have a flat surface. There's a peg in the center, and you're supposed to, supposed to look at the shadow of the peg at noon every day and see kind of how long the shadow is. So the shadow is going to be at noon, depending on where you are kind of uh, latitude-wise. And then they kind of mark the edge of that shadow. So if the shadow grows longer or if it grows shorter, then that means you're deviating from your western course. So that's the way they propose to, ah, now we know we're going west. That's one thing. And then the other thing they show in the show is like, well, what if there's no sun? How are you going to use this thing? And then they use a sunstone, which allows in the show, I guess, the ability to find the sun. Uh, so maybe we could talk real briefly about do we have evidence of either of these and you know, were they used to this uh, effect? Okay, well... Evidence? No, we we don't really have any. The closest thing we have for the sunboard, I mean, the the description of the sunboard is is a navigational principle that is really sound. I mean, people have been have used these this sort of technique before. We don't have any archaeological or textual evidence for the use of a sunboard like that. That's not to say they were necessarily not used. Um, the sagas are not renowned for getting into nitty gritty details about things like that um so it's very likely that if they were used they just didn't mention them because that's just a thing you did right that's like a, Holly a hollywood film getting into a car 
chase scene and they're talking about like okay you know the navigation is going to tell me to turn left here or like how do they drive the car they're not right, <laughs> worried exactly. about that exactly right like nobody unless it's relevant to the plot nobody is yeah. going no no film is going to be showing the people saying okay google maps says. <laughs> yeah. right um but we do i mean there are people who say we have found them uh that's because of a disc that kind of resembles what's shown in the the tv show it's a wooden disc that was found in Narsarsuak in Greenland. Um, and people thought, oh, this is a sunboard. This is a navigational tool. Except that the slits that were carved into it that would have been used for determining the, the position, the relative position of the, uh, of the ship, you know, based on the shadow and all that, are too irregular to actually be useful for navigation. Mm. Um, what we now figure they are is actually a confessional disc, uh, what's called a confessional disc, which is something that parish priests used to mark the number of people who have gone to confession in their in their parish, in their district, uh, for religious purposes. So it's it's less of a uh, less of a navigational tool in the temporal sense and more of a spiritual navigational tool, right? Like making sure that the people in the the region are are saved. Um, so not quite the same thing. So the, the sunboard, again, until we find, and it'll be tough to find it anyway because it's wood and wood deteriorates, um, mm. until we find something that is either concrete archaeological evidence or textual evidence, we're not really sure that they use them or how they use them. Um, and as far as the sunstone goes, that's, uh, that's what's called Iceland spar. It's a, a type of uh, of quartz, I believe it is, uh, and it's got a really neat property where it refracts the sun in, uh, or refracts light rather, in a certain way, and you can find where the sun is by pointing it at, uh, at the cloudy sky until the light turns a yellowish color, and that's really useful for determining which way the sun is located in. But based on the name, you might kind of figure where it's coming from, which is Iceland. Um, that's where it's mainly found in Iceland. Also in Mexico and New Mexico in the States, uh, and also in uh, China. And while it's not impossible to assume that Ragnar could have gotten a piece of what is now called Iceland Spar from a Chinese trader, um, it's given the context of the show, it's not really likely, especially considering that Iceland wasn't settled until 870 plus or minus 4. Uh, which is well after uh, the events that are described in the show. I'm not going to... I mean, it's historical, but I don't want to give anybody any spoilers and say, oh, after this character, has this happened to them? And so it's, But it, it, it's not likely that they were using uh, Iceland Spar to, to determine the location of the sun at that particular point in history makes sense so then if we kind of throw those out or put those on hold then the other ways to get around we can talk about those so i think it's kind of similar to the way people got around the mediterranean would be kind of people just had um knowledge over time built up they knew which way the the tides and the currents went mm -hmm. they used navigational landmarks or visual landmarks i should say um you can also use um animals for your benefit i was reading some references to actually oh if you see pods of whales or something that are in certain areas you can use that uh, yep. so there's lots of little cues here and there and i think you had a, a, a cute story about using ravens as well which we can discuss yeah yeah well that's the thing um you know navigation in the open water is super dangerous and super difficult at that time um the sagas which are our best literary sources are full of stories of people getting lost in fog or storms on open water um, that's how what's now uh, referred to, or what's referred to as Vinland in the sagas, it's now, you know, it's Newfoundland, Labrador, uh, Baffin Island, that part of Canada. Uh, that's how that was actually found. Uh, a guy named Bjarni Herjorsson was sailing to the western part of Greenland to visit his family, got blown off course during a storm, got lost in the fog, and in open water, and then eventually drifted towards land and saw you know, this land and said, okay, well, that's not where I want to go. I want to turn around and go back to, to Greenland. Um, so getting into open water was a dangerous thing. A lot of the, the journeys were done with island hopping because you can follow coastlines. You can see an island, uh, you know, on the horizon. You can keep land either in sight just on the horizon or you'd know where it is. Um, 
you can use animals for navigation. There's uh, one of the settlers, one of the first people to go to Iceland uh, is named Hrapna Floki, uh, the Raven Floki. And the reason they call him that is because the story is of him going to Iceland was that he stopped in the Faroes to, to resupply, which was a pretty common thing to do. And he took three ravens with him from the Faroe Islands. And they sailed west because they were going to be in open water. And after one day, he let the raven go and the raven flew back east. So he's like, oh, we are still too close for land because the bird knows that the closest land are the Faroe Islands. So we'll keep on sailing west. Day two rolls around. He lets the second bird go. And the bird just circles the boat and lands again. So he decides, well, we're in the middle of open water. There's no land nearby. And then the last day, he lets the bird go and it flies northwest. And he says, ah, that bird knows where there's land. Follow it. And they do follow it and he gets to Iceland that way. Um, and it's, it's a neat story. And the fact that it's something that we know birds do. You know, if it's not a seabird, if it's not like a sea eagle or a frigate bird or something that will fly across the ocean for weeks at a time they want to find land as quickly as possible they want to find some place to sit down because they're just not built to fly long distances like that so using birds using captive birds or following them to navigate is definitely something that could have been used a lot more frequently than is described in the sagas the fact that it's described at all in the sagas means that it's something that people may have been familiar with or or uh, may have thought was really neat and then started adopting. We're not quite sure, but it is an option for navigation that way. Makes sense. And that is when you consider the approach to the British Isles or Britannia, you want to either follow, I guess, the northern coast of France, or you want to go from Norway to the Shetlands and then kind of work your way down south. So you're kind of approaching it from two sides. Uh, I guess you could sail directly across if you have a better means of navigation, might be quickest. But other than that, if you use yeah. kind of the northern or the southern uh, perimeter, how long would that take you? Is it like uh, a week or less? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean they're they're, they're relatively close. So like you're looking like a week uh, or so of of sailing, roughly is what is what they figure. Um, if you're coming from Norway to get to the, for example, the Orkneys or the Shetlands, um, if you're coming from Denmark, you know you could you could be looking at about a week's worth of of travel, uh, maybe two or three days on open water if you're going straight across and then you'll see coastline of mm. northeastern England or what's now northeastern England. Uh, and then you can go wherever you feel like. So within, you know, five to seven days, you're basically where you want to be. Great. All right. Well, we've talked about the idea that they now want to go west. We've talked about how they orient themselves. And now let's talk about how they actually um, kind of what ferries them in that direction <laughs> that they've been wanting to go. So we're finally mm -hmm. now going to turn to the new shipbuilding methods. So in the show, um, like we said, one of the main points that they're going to say allows them to go west is this new ship that's going to be built uh, by this brilliant but mad scientist, so to speak, of the <laughs> of the uh, this like uh, this Viking shipbuilder. Uh, so he talks about it being lighter, carrying a bigger sh sail. He says the construction is different; it has a strong central plank. Uh, with uh, the strakes above it that are nailed directly into the knees of the frame, blah, blah, blah. He goes through saying this is, you know, cutting-edge technology. And I know you had some gripes about that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it was cutting-edge technology uh, in the 4th century when we start finding boats that are built like that in Norway, <laughs> right? Like, uh, from about 300 or so. Uh, and it's in, a, it's in, clink clinker-built, right, is the name? Yeah, that's the that's the style, yeah, is, is clinker-built uh, boats. Um and where you do have, they also call it lap strake building. I mean, you've got the the keel, and then the edges of the hull planks overlap, right? And it is really strong. It's it's a really useful way of constructing a ship for rough waters, especially in in northern waters, um, just because it's a lot tougher and it's a lot more flexible, which is what you want uh, up there. But it's it's not something that is brand spanking new in the seventh or eighth or ninth century. Um, you know the the ships are. Uh, I think three twenty is the earliest dating we've got for one of these Norwegian clinker built boats. Um, so you know they've been around. They've been around for a while. They've known. They not may not have been using sails. Um, they would have been primarily coastal fishing boats, so you don't really need a big sail for that. You know, you can just row your way around uh, for that. 
but they're not it's not a brand spanking new quantum leap in the build in shipbuilding technology that the show is presenting mm -hmm. and just like with the growth of trade and rating and all that it was something that was developed over time first i mm -hmm. think the idea that people kind of put forth is if trading and rating is happening in the east primarily early on that would kind of be a training ground for trying new new shipbuilding technologies uh new construction types so they kind of they train in the somewhat more agreeable you know baltic area and then after that they use these technologies to move west uh i guess over time after they've developed things and they they now have to face different types of problems being on the open mm -hmm. sea um so yeah there had to be a little bit more innovation but it's not some crazy guy who came up with something radically new it was kind of baby steps along the way yeah yeah and i mean yeah and it's it's like you mentioned it there are different types of sailing environments uh in the baltic versus the north sea um there there are different types of of well of water to to be moving a boat around in so it's um you know looking at the the sort of baltic area the baltic excursions as training wheels for the western excursions not necessarily the most accurate but they are a good way of of getting yourself used to hmm. how the boats and how the ships would handle in in water in general which isn't to say that it's not dangerous because of, of course whenever you go out on water it's going to be dangerous right there's always the chance that the boat can capsize can hit a rock whatever um but the the technologies that were sort of developed over the course of four or five hundred years before the the big raids in the western part of europe really start did kind of get their genesis in the baltic in that eastern part of the the sphere of the scandinavian sphere of influence if you will <laughs> Sweet. And just for, for context, because I've done videos in the past where we talk about kind of the Roman Navy, uh, Mediterranean mm -hmm. ships. I did want to compare real quickly a trireme versus a long ship. So I just looked up a <laughs> couple of stats. So I know the trireme was about 40 meters long and 6 meters wide. The long ship is a li uh, maybe like 30 meters long and 4 5, 5 meters wide. So smaller. The condition of the trireme had about 200 crew. Um, and you can maybe stack on maybe, I don't know, up to 50 marines at times if you're being pretty intrepid. Um, mm -hmm. So much bigger ships, more hulking, slower as a result, uh, whereas the Vikings were smaller, put fewer men aboard, but could go longer distances, faster, etc. So different kind of strategies in those two. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, different types of warfare uh, as well. Um, you know, with with Mediterranean warfare, you're looking at, you know, you're, you're ramming ships. You've got huge, huge vessels that are acting as essentially artillery platforms uh, for archers, for catapults, for whatever weird mechanical, you know, crow's beak or corvus uh, weapons they've got. You know, they're, they're fighting a very different sort of fight than you would have in a Scandinavian context. Because, um, yeah, uh, your, your average Scandinavian uh, longship, uh, the, they've classed it as the skev, um in, in some works, uh, you know, that's built based on the Skurdalev two sort of uh, boats um, that they found in Roskilde. Uh, it's around, yeah, like you said, about 30 meters. It'll hold about 70, maybe 80 people. Um, it's designed to go fast and designed if you want to fight ship to ship, you lash the ships together and you jump over the, the gunnels into the other boat. Um, you're... you're Prowmen, your your guys who are right at the the front end of the ship are the the best and the the baddest of your soldiers uh, when you're looking at ship to ship combat because they're the guys who are going to be fighting everybody else as the ship pulls alongside to get lashed together and then um, you're basically fighting a, a land battle a land infantry battle on a boat um, at that point you're not worrying about sinking the other boat specifically which tends to be um, an op more of an option in Mediterranean naval combat, classical Mediterranean naval combat, than it is in Scandinavian naval combat, because you're looking to, to kill the other guys and take their stuff, or take them as slaves. Mm -hmm. right? It's all about making sure you can come out of it in a profitable sort of way, rather than in a strategic, denying your enemy resources sort of way. Got it. Great. All right, well, I think we've... <laughs> 
spent like i said the like how we premise this we spent you know 30 seconds in the show in our time has <laughs> expanded out to 30 minutes which is good uh because as we've seen in this discussion there's a lot of kind of rabbit holes we could chase down in terms of stuff so um stay tuned for future episodes where we'll be definitely bringing back the viking gym here <laughs> in the future to discuss not only the tv show vikings i'm sure we can expand out to certain uh, portrayals of the Vikings and other mediums. I, we, we were talking about Northgard, for instance. Maybe do an episode on in the game Northgard. Uh, surviving winter is particularly tough, so we can do an episode where we talk about you know Viking winners, what they did then, how did they survive, how did that impact their culture. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned for a lot more of this stuff. Thank you everyone, and definitely, like I said, check out the Viking Gym on Twitter. All right, bye. Thanks very much. All right, bye.